Hello, and thank you for joining me. We've got a really special treat for you today, so don't go anywhere. This was Klaus Meyer. And this is Klaus Meyer. Where to even begin? Well, for starters, this is the person who is considered the founder of the new Nordic cuisine movement. He literally wrote a manifesto about it. This is a philosophy with influence not only in Scandinavia, but also in fine restaurants all throughout the world. While buzzwords like sustainable, local, and seasonal are now commonplace, 20 years ago it was a different story in many parts of the world, including Scandinavia. And Klaus helped to push to make these concepts guiding lights for not only ambitious chefs, but for home cooks as well. Heard of the restaurant Noma? I thought so. He is a co-founder. And the fame and success of Noma fostered an environment for many other restaurants and chefs pushing forward with this philosophy in Copenhagen. And in a short span of time, Copenhagen has become a global hotspot for restaurants, when not so long ago people would say, well, you don't go to Denmark for the food. Klaus owns several restaurants and he has also hosted many different food television programs over the years, with more in the works. As you might imagine, he has written many cookbooks as well. And just recently, he put out his memoirs, so be on the lookout for that. Klaus's ambition is not limited to the kitchen either. He is the founder of several NGOs which seek to bring positive social change through food. He is an associate professor of food science at the University of Copenhagen. He owns food supply companies and has products like vinegar and baked goods available in grocery stores all over Denmark. He met Obama. He met the Pope. And he is knighted by the Queen of Denmark. To get a bit more personal, how do I know him? Well, he is my boss. I first worked for him in the Great Northern Food Hall, a venture he launched in New York City. This is also where I met the person who would become my wife, a native Dane. And years later, when my partner and I set out to continue our lives together in Denmark, Klaus was eager to give me a job. Unfortunately, despite having that job offer on the table with the contract signed, getting approval from immigration authorities proved to be a long and difficult process, lasting almost two years with a lot of stress and travel back and forth between countries. Yet Klaus stood by me the entire time, never once rescinding his offer, and even going so far as to write articles in the Danish papers in attempts to bring attention to the sluggishness of the immigration authorities at a time when many hotels and restaurants were desperate for labor in positions that natives were not filling. But at long last I was finally granted a work visa, and now I'm once again working for Klaus, and despite his packed schedule, he agreed to do a little video with me. So today we are cooking and serving at Klaus's house. But what to cook for the so-called godfather of Nordic cuisine? Well, it should be something special. And for me, nothing says special quite like a really beautifully prepared duck. So that's what I'm going to do. And as an homage to Agern, the first Klaus restaurant that I worked at, I will prepare it in that style. That is, dry aged and gently smoked with hay. So, I have here a nice duck, and I only want to dry age the crown, so I need to do a little butchery. First, I'm taking off the wing tips, and as I go, I'll just trim off any pockets of fat that seem excessive. We can render that down and save it for later. Duck fat is famously delicious. I'm also trimming off that tailbone. Then I'm just taking off the legs, taking care to make sure I don't leave behind those nice pieces of meat where the leg meets the back of the bird. By the way, a duck's anatomy is very close to a chicken, so don't be intimidated if you've never cooked with duck before and want to give it a try. And it looks like I also get a little packet of giblets with the bird. Very nice. And for the sake of having a nice stock, I will go ahead and also take the flat part of those wings off as well. And with the same reasoning in mind, I will also go ahead and use a pair of strong scissors to cut out the backbone as well. And now we are looking good. We have our crown ready to go, our legs ready to be confit, and our wings and backbone for a sauce, and even some giblets to use. As for how to dry age, you are mostly letting time do the work. I'm not very good with knots, but after fooling around with some butcher's twine, I eventually managed to get the duck carcass strung up in my fridge so that the air could flow all around it. And now I just let it go. Just make sure to check in on it occasionally to make sure it isn't getting too funky and change out the dripping plate underneath. 
For now, let's quickly talk about the rest of the duck. Like I said, I will use those back pieces and wings to make a stock. So I just brown those deeply in the oven. I'm also throwing in a few chicken legs for added body. I'm just covering everything with water in a pot and some aromatics and simmer everything for about six hours, straining the fat and impurities as I go. Then I just strain all those solids away and I have a beautiful duck stock. Then I simply reduce that stock significantly until the taste intensifies and the liquid gains a bit of viscosity. Then I will just add the final touches to the sauce when I'm serving. For the legs, I am just doing a simple confit. So I cured the duck legs overnight, being very basic with the seasoning because I have specific plans in mind for these legs. And the following day, I got them in a heavy pot, added a generous amount of duck fat, got that fat hot, and then let them cook very gently overnight in the oven at about 100 degrees Celsius. And after a night of slow cooking, that meat was fall off the bone tender and deeply flavorful. I just kept those duck legs stored in duck fat in the fridge until the day of serving. At that point, I take some of the meat off the bone and then I mix it with a bit of fresh apple dice and some roasted dice of celeriac. This I used to make a little cabbage and meat pocket to serve alongside the roasted breast of duck. Pointed cabbage is much loved by the Danes, so I wanted to incorporate it into the dish. And speaking of duck breast, back in the fridge, after about a week, our duck crown is looking ready for the main event. See how that skin has really dried out? That will make for a really nice and crispy end result when we go to cook it. But before we do that, we just need an important element of flavor, and that is smoke. In this case, hay smoke. I'm just going to use my kettle grill and I will just give that duck a little brush with some bourbon which will help give the smoke something to latch onto. It's certainly not from Denmark, but I wanted a little allusion to my own home. So with the setup ready, I just light a little bit of hay and then immediately tamp the flame down so we just get smoke, no fire. And then we let the duck have its smoke sauna for a bit. At this point, we just want flavor, no actual cooking. And once that is over, we are ready to cook. Over at Klaus's house, he was taking some meetings at his kitchen table, so I got to work on the duck breast quietly. I wanted to slowly render that fat out and crisp up that skin, so I started with a cold frying pan that I set on medium once the duck was in the pan. And every so often I would rotate the duck so that the skin got crispy on all sides and the heat was evenly distributed. Once I had the skin rendered to where I wanted it, I let it finish in a low oven. At this point, I wanted to finish my duck jus, so I got it in a pot and heated it up. Then I just whisked in some butter. And for a little acid, a quick side note, Klaus is crazy about apples and apple cider vinegar. So much so that he has a Solaris style setup in his garage attic. This is the same method employed to make true aged balsamic vinegar, but in this case, it is based on apples. Some of these vinegars are many years old, so I was excited that Klaus let me take a little dropper so that I could use some to finish my duck jus. It was just the perfect thing. Once the duck was roasted to the appropriate doneness of medium, I took it out of the oven and let it rest for a little while so the juices could settle. Once it had rested, I scrounged around Klaus's kitchen for a cutting board and a knife and set about carving the duck. At this point, all I needed to do was saute my little cabbage triangle, so I brown it a little bit on both sides. Then I put my carved duck breast in the pan as well and give them both just a few minutes in the oven. In the meantime, I nervously do some last minute tasting of the duck jus, and then I find a plate. Then the duck and cabbage comes out of the oven. Lastly, I just slice that duck breast about in half. This Agern duck dish was an interpretation of the duck from 11 Madison Park, and there they would only serve about one third of the breast. But here we are just making a reference to fine dining, not doing actual fine dining, so it's okay to be a little more generous. Now I just get that on the plate with the cabbage pocket, and then of course a generous amount of that apple cider infused duck jus. And now to serve to the man of the hour. I'm not much into dramatic reaction shots, and I promised Klaus he wouldn't have to do anything like that, 
but I will tell you he thought it was delicious and, quote, very well executed. So I can live with that, but I wasn't quite done yet. I wanted to do one more duck dish that was a little more casual. Because while Klaus has some serious connections to the fine dining world, he also has a lot of focus on elevating the food of home cooking. I also know he loves Asian food, and I spent some time in Thai restaurants, so I decided to do a Nordic take on a larb salad. And look, I know fusion food can get gimmicky really quickly, but I was just having some fun here. In our conversation after eating, we get into the topic of food potential. And I think this plays into this dish by showing off what you can do even when you limit yourself to Danish ingredients, especially in this modern era. So if you don't know the larb salads of Thailand and Laos, they are highly seasoned dishes often containing meat or seafood and lots of herbs. So I came up with a little collection of Danish ingredients to try to mirror a larb dish. For the protein in this case I'm using the duck meat from the legs that I comb feed. And I just saute those up briefly in the pan so they get hot and take a little color. Then they go into a bowl. Scallions and onions are a common ingredient in larb dishes. And so we stick to tradition with this Danish red onion I just slice up. And for a little body and crunch I have some strips of that pointed cabbage that I had used to make the cabbage packet. In that goes. Acid is an important component of any larb. And this is where I start to get a little out there with it. I'm using some pickled green figs along with a bit of their pickling liquid. It brings acid but also sweetness and a bit of, for lack of a better word, exotic taste. I also used some of that excess duck skin to make duck cracklings. And those are going in the mix. Herbaceousness is also an important element. And for that I have here some beautiful hydroponic citron melisse or lemon balm. I think it's great that a country with a short growing season can lean on modern advantages to expand the range of possibilities in the kitchen. And if the hothouse is utilizing clean energy, then there is truly no downside. So in goes a nice big handful. Speaking of modern advantages, thanks to places like the Noma Fermentation Lab, domestically produced garums are now a reality. Which is great news for me because I needed something to replicate the taste of fish sauce. So. In with a few spoons of that. And just to keep things fun, I'm adding some pickling liquid from pickled rose hips. And for a bit more sharp acid, we turn once again to Klaus for some help and use a bit of his own brand of cider vinegar. This one is not nearly as aged, but is still very tasty and versatile. Larb dishes often have a toasted rice component, but rice is not native to Denmark. However, buckwheat is, and so before I came to Klaus's house, I roasted some buckwheat kernels in a pan and ground them coarsely with my mortar and pestle. I threw a couple spoons of that in the salad when you weren't looking. Now all that is left to do is give it a good mix and no fancy plating here. Just get it onto the plate and it's ready to serve. This was my first time making this dish, but it was really quite tasty and Klaus enjoyed it also. It's funny how even though there is no lime juice or cilantro in here, it still really reminds you of a larb salad when you eat it. Next time it just needs a little something spicy. After serving Klaus, it was time to sit down and have a chat with him. Full disclosure, I was a bit nervous because I really wanted it to go well, but also I'm not as familiar with having impromptu conversations on camera. But I think Klaus's energy makes up for it. But anyway, let's just get into it. A conversation with Nordic food godfather and Noma co-founder. Klaus Meyer. Part of your like fame is, you know, of course, Noma co-founder, right? Um, but I think that one of the nice, the, the things that people don't maybe understand as much is how much value or perspective you bring to like the home cook. And I mm -hmm. think that that's... Uh, yeah, you know, from all our conversations about the, the balancing the flavor in a little sauce or in a simple soup that, I mean, the, the, the attention to detail means so much even, and you, you can take a very simple thing that can be... I mean, uh, 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 so many recipes can be ruined, ruined by, by the lack of attention, but, but even in the hands of, a, of, a, of an ordinary home cook, it can be, it can be you know, a, a, a perfect uh, flavor experience. If only uh, a, a few uh, um, details are, are being given attention to. Yeah. That's uh, the kind of conversation that we have when we taste the food together very often, because that is not, I mean, in Lyngby, it, it's, it's uh, really nice food, but we never, go, you know, fine dining. No, I think, you know, for one thing, just the sheer limitation 
is one aspect, but also it's not our, our style either. <clears throat> so when we come up with dishes at Lungbu, I try to look to the fine dining past and, and find ways to incorporate something that just shows finesse but without the pretension. And I really, exactly. I really like that yeah, about, I like that about your style. Um, but I guess jumping off of uh, the, the Noma thing, would you, would you say that like uh, it's at all annoying that you like, it can, the, do, you, do you like that Noma sometimes is the second thing that people like associate with? Uh, or do, would you like people to know more about your, because you have so, there's so much in your yeah. life. When I was doing your biography in the intro, I was like, I, I don't know when this guy has time to sleep, because uh, there's I'm, so much. I try trust people, so I, I, I very often let people run away with stuff, um, and I trust that this will go fine. And I also realize I cannot control everything, but but um, I don't mind. I mean, I obviously don't mind being associated with a restaurant that ended up being one of the best in the world. But uh, but now that you you mentioned it, I do think that. Um, what annoys me a little bit is that so few people actually realize that that Noma, well, one thing is that it became a fine dining temple, but uh, what people tend to not talk about is the way in which Noma has, has spearheaded a, a, a transformation of uh, the food culture in the Nordic country, uh, in the Nordic countries and beyond, which was right. to me the whole point. I mean, my point was to, 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 to set up a restaurant that would, that would be able to, to help transform people's ideas about the potential of local Scandinavian ingredients and, and the whole terroir aspect of cooking. And, and, and the whole point for me from the very beginning was to, um, to, to leverage the, the position of Noma, wherever it ended being, uh, to benefit um, the food of the many people in our region because I was so annoyed by the fact that food was and has been forever so shitty in Denmark. Even though we are one of the wealthiest nations in the world, I found that very uh, counterintuitive. And I, I, I have been struggling my entire life to find a way to, to um, unfold the natural potential of, of our people and our nature and our food culture. And somehow Noma ended up doing the trick but, but, but that is the one thing that, that, that people typically don't talk about when they mention Noma. So I don't mind being credited for Noma sure. uh, at all. I mean, why would I? Right. But, but, <laughs> but I do think that it, it is a little bit annoying that, that um, it, it seems to be uh, taken out of, of, of my world, of the equation. Because, sure. because no matter what, um, how many stars the restaurant won, and I, you know, we can applaud it, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, I have the deepest respect for what this team has achieved for itself. But, but I'm, 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 I'm much more, um, uh, what do you say, blown away by the impact we ended up having on, on, on food culture at large. Yeah, I think potential is like the, the key word there because uh, <clears throat> you take like the, when, when you, when you get yourself to a point where you can say, okay, we don't have to go outside for fine ingredients, we can make do with what we have, I think that that uh, is, is really special. Like the, the larb salad that I made was a, t a take on like Southeast Asian, but let's say, uh, so you have the, the, the fish sauce is like, uh, you can make garum now. Like not because of things, guys like, uh, you know, David Zibler and, and Renee, like I think it's hard to, uh, to understand like just, oh, we want to make soy sauce. That's, but make it from stuff from our own land. Like that, that's a crazy undertaking. And I think that really, like you say, I think potential, I'm talking too much, but the word is just potential. When you unlock the potential so you can say, no, you can have a quote, uh, you know, greatest restaurant in the world in a place that uh, isn't what typically is thought of as, as being as fertile or as uh, uh, as generous of, uh, a land as you know more southern Europe or France or something like this. Because you, you can you can make the thing the building blocks yourself, and in a way, when you build them yourself, it's even better than when you just use the product. Uh, the fine mm -hmm. product that's important, which is impressive, I think. Yeah, that I, really I, changes the 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 whole di the whole dynamic, basically. Yeah. And I think that this goes far beyond the whole 
a concept of cooking because it's also, I mean, when, when people start uh, foraging berries or mushrooms or um, understanding that the broad beans or lupins can be turned into shoyu, which is a, a cousin of soy sauce, then suddenly they connect with uh, nature in a different way. Suddenly it becomes interesting to be a food entrepreneur. Uh, suddenly you can see a way out of this uh, animal a husbandry um, trap mm -hmm. that we have ended up with in Denmark because suddenly, well, I mean, legumes can be a high value product. And, and, and um, once food is more than what you just eat to be full, which, uh, which is what it was in Denmark for the many, for most people just 25, 30 years ago, um, where we had no restaurant culture, we had no, no decent uh, home cooking at all people were eating stuff from cans and fro freezers, even though we are a pretty wealthy nation. Uh, yeah. I think that, that, that attention to beauty and, 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 and sense of poetry and um, uh, a, a totally another understanding of the relationship between man and nature has been developed through, um, I mean, thanks to the, to the work of a limited number of, of chefs. Um, so I think that, that just to say there's more into this right. than just um, how many Michelin stars have we won yeah, for and, sure. it's and not uh, just how, many, how many liters of yeah. shoyu is being produced <laughs> locally now. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I was going to, this is a good point too, that you say, you talk a lot about uh, <clears throat> what food culture was just 20 years ago and I bring up in the, in the intro uh, that these words like local, uh, seasonal, organic, are almost like cliche words now, but like not so long ago mm -hmm. it wasn't so. And I, I guess I would ask, uh, um, what, what would you say is some of the like most obvious ways that you've noticed that things are better now in Denmark? And what, on the other side of that, what are some things where you think could still use some, some, uh, some, some there's some room for growth? Because uh, you know, I, I look around and I'm, I'm impressed with the, the availability of uh, at just at the, your local grocery store, like you can go to Rima, for instance, and you have uh, you have like seasonal items. Sometimes they'll have a different uh, fish that particular season, or you can get kondo, you know, uh, or you can get uh, pheasant, which is for me coming from the states something you would never see. Uh, so it's very impressive to see that sort of thing. Um, you know, and now the, on the other hand of it. Sometimes I'll see the, the growing popularity of things like HelloFresh or something, and I feel a part of me that's, I don't know, feels not depressed. So what, <laughs> yeah. So what can grow? What can grow and what, uh, what, what have you, what's been most impressive, I guess, as far as growth? I mean, so most far? impressive definitely has been the, the, um, the evolution of the restaurant scene, particularly in the bigger cities, but even in the countryside. Uh, next to that, I mean, and it's not the only fine dining, it's also at bistro level. So we have, I mean, I would say we have one of the most amazing um, bistro brasserie um, in Otega. I mean, simple restaurant scenes in the entire world. Um, then, uh, I mean, the whole bakery scene is obviously pretty astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, I mean, where, where things can, I mean, and I agree that, that very decent produce is uh, widely available all over the country. But I do think that we we are we are lagging behind when it comes to um, specialty food items. I mean, yes, we have gotten a couple of new dairies. We have, I mean, a number of breweries have have been uh, initiated uh, by you know entrepreneurs. But uh, overall, I do think that that is where we really are, are lagging behind some of the more sophisticated um, culinary nations like Spain or Italy and France. Right. Um, and, and then I do think that, um, I mean, I, th I see that a whole new generation has been truly, seems to be truly inspired by what has been going on the past 25 years where so many people have been speaking about this culinary transformation. So I do see that, uh, that on the one hand, it's not that the whole generation want to be professional chefs, and that is actually a little bit of a problem. But um, we see that, um, I mean, youngsters, they actually take a joy in, in cooking for themselves, for their friends, and for their family. And that, I think, is, is super positive. I think that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the foundation you can build upon. It's funny, though, like, uh, I think of something like pickling, 
um, whereas when I was getting into cooking in the early college days, I was excited about you know doing all sorts of pickling projects. And I would ask my mom about like how she felt about it. And she's like, I never want to do pickling ever again because she grew up. So I think it's funny how it can go in these waves, right? It's like one generation yeah, that would pickle was, again. That's right. was uh, That's did right. too much pickling and, and then uh, enjoy the fact that you can just That's go right. to the store and get a jar of pickles. But then the next generation's like, well, how, do you, how does this happen? Well, then, I mean, in the past, we had a whole chunk of, of cucumber with the foods because the food was lacking all kinds of flavors. So sure. we had to eat some pickle it, stuff besides <laughs> it for this to be palatable at all. Pickles. But now I see so many, I mean, so many more innovative ways in which um, pickled items enter into into the plate. I mean, one, sure. your, your salad is one thing where you have the, not, not just the, I mean, we would never in the past use the pickling liquid to season a dish, which right. is what you are doing. You would also season the brown sauce. I don't know if you did that, but but I mean, and then we could chop the pickled stuff finely and, and enter into a, into a tatar thing or, um, so, 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 I mean, I see a new, a, a, a more versatile approach to, to pickle stuff, but, but, but also just uh, simply an appetite for pickling. Yeah. Acid in particular, I feel like, is, is having a heyday right now. I feel like high acid foods are just mm -hmm. kind of popular across the board. And we can delete whatever. But um, uh, would you describe your relationship with Renee as like a, a like a brotherly, sort of like frenemy, or sort of a, like not frenemy? Yeah, now we're kind of, I mean, brotherly is probably the right word to begin with. I was you know, more yeah. the mentor, and he was the young 25 year old cook, chef who, you know, took upon this responsibility to be. To assume the the being like an operating partner of the restaurant and also being responsible for the culinary side of things, and then he grew into being not just a, a head chef but even a, I mean, a CEO yeah. most of the place and a restaurateur definitely, and also a change maker uh, um, and a serial entrepreneur. So I, I guess that he, I, I'm, I hope that he will. When we, if he had been asked a question, that he would say that he was inspired by the way in which I did my things, but he did it his way and not yeah. my way. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm sure. I mean, we be, we both benefited a lot from from being closely together for those four or five years, and we we laid the foundation for something that ended up, um, you know, producing um, incredible opportunities uh, and avenues for, I mean, for his world and for my world. Sure. And, uh, sure. So. I think, uh, but today, I really, when, I, when I saw him, when I went to Noma to eat a couple of, maybe a month ago, and you know, and he came and took my chair out and asked me to sit down and enjoy oh, that's uh, cute. dinner <laughs> at the hands of his empire. Yeah. And um, it felt really like meeting a brother you hadn't seen for, for two years. That's sweet. So do you think you could get me a reservation at Noma then? No, that's just a joke. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I think, like, so like you said, in your world and in his world, and I think that's... Because they've been a little bit separated. Because sure. he, he went his kind of super elitarian, fine dining, yeah. seduced the most uh, unattainable journalists. I mean, he went this kind of very... Sure. Yeah. And I, I, you know, focused more on, on how to benefit, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say the world at last, but at least the many people with, with, um, with, with the energy and the findings and... Um, yeah, from, and, uh, no, from, 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 from Norma and the Nordic Cuisine movement. That became my, my focus point. Because I think a lot of focus ends up always on the most elite restaurants when I think at the end of the day, if you could move, and not to discredit like what they do either, because I, I love that world too, uh, but if you can <clears> move <throat> the needle in the home cook's world, that in a way is, is more... Uh, will have more like a greater reaching impact. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's also just a matter of now when I, I have experienced what what um, cooking for myself and for friends and family has has done to my life, and I don't want to not give everyone I meet almost the chance to to have his or her life uh, opened up for all of that, all of that that um, bounty. Um, I mean, who would I be if I didn't do everything? Uh, that I could to to bring that uh, appetite for cooking and for and, and 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 all those opportunities and experiences into the into the lives of the many people. Now that I totally incidentally was given that chance myself, 
Yeah. Uh, because I, I just randomly ended up in, 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 in an incredible home in southern France when I was 20 and that totally changed my life. Yeah. So, and then on a more serious level, we are witnessing the, uh, the collapse of uh, the global food systems because people, and then not just the food system, but also so many people are, are getting all kinds of diseases because they eat unhealthily. Um, so we eat unwisely, we eat unhealthily. And uh, so I do think that there is a, uh, also that very important aspect to it that, that um, uh, it's not only a matter of, you know, uh, improving the, I mean, giving people access to a higher quality of life right now. It's also a matter of, of doing everything we can so that we as a, as a generation uh, hand over uh, a planet that is livable. To the next generation, and and and, and the, the easiest way to get there would be to, you know, inspire people to cook, uh, especially with vegetables. Right. So, so that, that is what is at stake. Also, I was going to say because uh, on the one hand, it's like oh, uh, you look at a, a dish from Noma or something, where it's like oh, it's nice that you can eat ants, but it's like it's also nice. <laughs> that you can just put a, a beautiful piece of speed skull, like really heavy sear or grill on the plate and, and in a way that's that's also okay. Like, And I think that uh, can, can open people's minds in a, in a bit too. It doesn't have to be, it, to break people away from this idea of like big piece of protein on a plate, uh, uh, but if you can get away from that and mm -hmm. it can still be delicious and nice, it's, yeah, I think that's where you can really make an impact. And all it is is just sort of changing the attitude, I think. And changing the attitude can just be a matter of eating something tasty. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So there you have it. Thank you for joining me today. And of course, a big thank you to Klaus Meyer for taking the time to do this video with me and for making my life in Denmark possible. I hope you enjoyed this look at one of my favorite preparations of duck and maybe my take on a Nordic larb salad will inspire you to get a little experimental with your own home cooking. And hopefully you enjoyed our cozy conversation after the cooking. If you watched this far, you might as well hit the like button to help me out, and please consider a subscription. I mostly do relaxing home cooking videos, but occasionally I have special guests like in this episode. So there is something for everyone, and feel free to write something in the comments section if you have any questions or thoughts. It is always fun to hear from folks. Until next time, cheers. Skull.